Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We are going to be starting our presentation in approximately one minute. Thank you for your patience. Well, once again, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn session on volunteerism. My name is Natalie Ramirez and I am a Major Gifts Officer in the Office of Engagement. I would like to introduce our Chief Development Officer, Aaron Bowles, who will lead us in prayer. Natalie, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our leadership and um, breakfast, lunch and learn. And Today's prayer is a prayer for balance, and it comes from um, Notre Dame University's Book of Prayer. Lord, help me to create a balanced life. Help me to take time to enjoy life, to be a person full of gratitude. Help me take time to love, to extend my hand in service to those around me. Lord, remind me to take time to learn, to be disciplined and accountable. Help me to make a difference in the small and big moments of my life. Lord, help me to keep smiling, to be happy, and to try to be myself. Lord, infuse me with your spirit so I can create a life of balance, moderation, and simplicity. And whatever my challenge, let it be an occasion to deepen my life's purpose. Amen. Thank you, Erin. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers, Mikkel Christensen and Julie Martin. Mikkel Christensen has been with Catholic Charities for five years and oversees volunteer services for behavioral health, child welfare, and intellectual disability programs, as well as providing supervision for the two Safe Streets Violence Prevention Program sites by the agency. Born in Oslo, Norway, Mikkel immigrated to the US with his mother when he was 10 years old. After high school, he worked with volunteers in a nonprofit setting based out of Northern Ireland facilitating volunteer work internationally and locally for international service participants before finishing college in Belfast. He moved to Baltimore in 2013, where he lives with his wife and two young children. Julie Martin is the volunteer manager at My Sister's Place Women's Center, a comprehensive resource center for women and children experiencing homelessness and poverty in Baltimore City. She began her career at Catholic Charities as an administrative assistant at Sarah's House, a supportive housing program offering emergency shelter and project-based supportive housing with an array of services for fam families experiencing homelessness in Anne Arundel County. Julie graduated from Soka University of America, where she majored in international studies and Chinese. Before joining Catholic Charities, Julie worked as an English teacher in Taiwan amongst other jobs, before realizing her mission in life and passion was to help others. Julie credits the agency with giving her a clear-cut path to fulfill her passion, and she's extremely grateful that her day-to-day -day work involves connecting community members seeking the chance to help with those in need. Welcome, Mikkel and Julie. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, so the way Julie and I structured this was we're kind of gonna alternate talking a little bit about uh, what volunteerism has looked like traditionally in our programs, as well as what it looks like now uh, during the pandemic and what some of the changes we had to make was were. Obviously, uh, <laughs> we weren't expecting to, uh, to make a lot of these changes uh, when we started this year. Um, but uh, one of the great things about Catholic Charities is that our volunteer managers try to work together to come up with ideas. So you'll, even though we run quite different programs, um, I think we try to help each other out. So 
you'll see some of the ways in which we um, did volunteerism at our family services programs on starting on the next slide. Um, we, so the family services division serves uh, all of the, we we're, consist of all of the villa named programs. So the programs you associate with behavioral health, uh, with working with kids, um, with, uh, we also have Gallagher services uh, that works with adults with intellectual disabilities in our program. So we have quite an array of different types of volunteering opportunities normally. And I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but here were some of the ones that we can offer for contrast. So for instance, we have a therapeutic mentoring program that works uh, at St. Vincent's Villa and the Villa, Villa Maria mental health clinics out in the community where we have uh, mentors who volunteer to meet up once a week with uh, Five, with with them, well. with um, with mentees, uh, and what that normally would look like would be an hour long Thank visit you. where there was Lovely, um, maybe activities that they put partook in together, or maybe went out to lunch, or uh, they picked them up from school. So you can show the next slide, Dana. We also had uh, a lot of groups helping with events. So uh, maybe most weekends at St. Vincent's Villa, we might have a college group or, or a corporate group of some kind helping uh, with our recreational activities. We'd have special events throughout the year. Um, folks working, you see, you see pictures there of, uh, of, of the Villa Fair, which uh, is a summer event that we do with, with um, Harkins Builders. And uh, the Gallagher Services Day programs would have uh, high school students come every week to work in the day programs. Uh, so that would be on-site day programs. And you'll see how we've transitioned a little bit in, in a bit here. Go to the next slide. And of course we have individuals as well who we kind of slot in on a per interest per need basis uh, all across of our program. So we have folks that help out in classrooms, uh, folks that, uh, so that would work in the units at St. Vincent's Villa with kids, maybe uh, doing reading in the evening or some tutoring. Uh, one of our uh, other flagship programs would be the Special Friends with Gallagher Services where we pair a high school student with uh, someone who participates in Gallagher Services. Um, to just basically build friendship together and build experience. And we have a number of volunteers too who help uh, with vocational training. So one of the primary ways that we're doing that is through horticulture. So you see some of that. Uh, we also want to lump in our interns here too. Um, because we appreciate them very much. We get uh, undergraduates and graduate students from all over the state and even out of state working in our Bill and Maria programs uh, at our outpatient clinics and also uh, at St. Vincent's Villa and Bill and Maria School. Can go to the next slide. So once the pandemic began, so going back to March, uh, we had to think very quickly on how we wanted to uh, proceed because uh, you know, we had to weigh the risk versus the benefits of, of um, of continuing with our program. So I'm gonna not go in order here, but so for instance, with our mentoring program, we kind of used two weeks to wind down a little bit uh, until we figured out how to go remote and virtual um, because you can't just interrupt those, those uh, relationships with kids that can be quite, um, quite jarring. So we did have to end our undergraduate internships early uh, but we did continue our graduate internships on a school by school basis. And the reason we do that is because our, our graduate students actually offer therapy services uh, to, to a lot of the people that we serve. So we couldn't just stop offering the same volume of therapy services. In fact, you might think during a pandemic, uh, those types of services are really essential. So we tried to work with our graduate students to do the same as our staff, which some would come in person, some would transition online. Um, we by and large suspended in-person volunteering 
And what was really hard for uh, our St. Vincent's Villa kids and our, uh, the people that we serve at Gallagher Services was, was that family visits were suspended, off-grounds trips were suspended, and we've made some modifications to that since then. But um, as you can imagine, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of norms of day-to-day -day life uh, had to wind down. Uh, we suspended the day program at Gallagher Services, and immediately what we saw that to fill this hole, our staff were really crying out for, okay, now we really need to do things um, with the people that we serve, right? So we, we were not having uh, folks come on site anymore and host activities. Um, we're not able to go off site as much. So uh, we started having an increase in, uh, in, in demand for activity items that people could donate. So we saw a lot of our donors rally around that, uh, to, um, supplying craft kits uh, that, that kids or, or people that we serve can use uh, in their spare time, um, or basketballs, footballs, all that kind of stuff so, uh, so that we could safely um, continue our operations as best as possible. I'm gonna turn it over to Julie here. Hello everyone, I'm Julie. I'm the volunteer manager at My Sister's Place Women's Center. Um, and so even though Mikhail and I have served different populations, I think a lot of our agency and as a whole has gone through a lot of difficulties this year and a lot of challenges, but I'm really proud of where our programs have been able to go. So I'm really excited to share that with you. Next slide. Please. So um, before COVID-19, um, so to get started, we are a day resource center. So no one stays overnight in our shelters, um, but we were kind of a safe haven for women to be able to access really essential needs. And that's where our volunteer opportunities came from. So one of the biggest entryways to our program is our meal services. Prior to COVID-19, we served three meals a day, every day of the year. A big part of this was volunteer meal groups coming in and bringing food to prepare and helping us serve our ladies as well. Um, our dining hall is really unique because we see our ladies at tables and then we serve them at the tables as well. It's not a line. Um, so this was really key to have volunteers to help us be able to execute this while supporting our staff who need to take care of the client's um, well-being. Next slide, please. We also had volunteers that helped us facilitate workshops. So uh, we don't wanna just provide basic essential services. We wanna provide a community. And a big part of this came from the activities or opportunities we're able to offer them, which is really supplemented by the community. Uh, so we used to have life skills and professional workshops that were centered on the eight realms of wellness. The eight realms of wellness include financial wellness, emotional wellness, environmental. So things that some people might not initially come to mind um, when they're thinking of people experiencing homelessness. But what we've seen is these clients really need more than just money. They really need more than just things. And we're able to provide this because of volunteers, because community members really want to help them. So we would have, uh, you know, fun activities like bingo. We would have spiritual activities uh, like spiritual enlightenment, domestic violence and safety planning. We had yoga that was offered to the ladies, as well as line dancing, HIV testing that was provided by healthcare from the homeless. Um, so we really tried to provide anything that these ladies could possibly need. And we were only able to do that because of our volunteers. Next slide, please. Our volunteers were also really key in helping our ladies get the donations that they needed. So they would help us sort donations such as clothing, uh, making sure they're sized down and easy for staff to get to. They would help us organize toiletries and even put them into kits so they're easy, ready for staff to hand out. And they would help us organize our food. So making sure that we're using our food donations wisely and efficiently, um, constantly rotating out items, making sure we're using fresh or items that are about to expire first. So they were really, really, really key to making sure that our services weren't just there, but that they flowed well and flowed efficiently, which is really important to our clients. A lot of the times what they're experiencing from day to day is not um, never smooth. You know, it's always with bumps and with obstacles, but they were able to come to our center and access all of these services and access our community as well. Next slide, please. 
we also were using volunteers to help with new initiatives. So we had volunteers, so we had an activity in motion to have an actual clothing closet with designated shop hours for clients, um, shop in quotation marks because it would still be free to them, but to, in the same way of the dining experience to provide a better experience for them, to help them feel more comfortable and feel like they have more autonomy in their lives. Um, this was going to be supplemented by volunteers who would help be shopping assistants basically and in that way to another way for for people to really connect um, with these individuals next slide please so once the pandemic began uh, we moved to outreach and remote services until we we're able to safely accommodate clients inside again the biggest obstacle that we hit first was that all of our meal service items and supplies were for sit-down meals so we were really proud that we never used disposable items before. We, you know, we always washed them and were uh, eco-friendly about it. But now we needed to create meals that they could physically take with them. Um, we also had to suspend showers and phone services because these were indoors. But uh, to-go meals, mail and laundry continued. So we were able to still provide some key services, especially the mail portion um, for those individuals who get some sort of income through the mail or some sort of benefit through the mail. We wanted to make sure they were still able to access that without any um, type of gap. We had to suspend our in-person volunteering in the same way that we had to move everything um, to outreach. And um, that was definitely very hard for a lot of people, for our staff, you know, as I went over, the volunteers helped our program so much. And so um, our staff really stepped up and, you know, did different tasks that they weren't used to, but it was really apparent how much we needed the volunteers to make sure we're able to help as many people as possible. So the focus at that time was how we could continue to provide meals without the volunteer groups as well. Um, a lot of them, like I said, had brought in meals and this really helped with our, our budget, which wouldn't be able to accommodate three meals um, every day, just the number of women that we were serving. So how could we still provide these meals now that that volunteering had stopped? So it involved you know, doing a whole inventory check of what supplies that we had and trying to ration things out. Um, and it was an all hands on deck kind of situation. We also really needed to figure out how to continue to provide case management as well as therapy and other behavioral health services, especially to these clients that had limited accessibility. A lot of these women came to our program in order to have a place to access these things. Um, and they came to our program to use the phone, you know, and then everything started moving to tele telehealth and or trying to do things over the internet. And a lot of these women got access for Wi-Fi in public spaces too that are now closed to them. So, um, you know, as Mikhail said, we really weren't prepared for how drastically everything was gonna change and how drastically our needs were gonna change. Next slide, please. So we converted from the sit-in meals to to-go meals, which was really challenging because we lacked the materials to package up that many. So, you know, had to start thinking about everything from lunch bags to sandwich bags to utensils, to condiments, um, items that we just didn't have at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, but a lot of our volunteers and donors then kind of really stepped up as well and provided all of these materials. I'm really proud to say that we didn't even though it was very up in the air, what we would be able to provide when this initially happened, we have not run out of anything. We've been able to provide everything that a client needs as far as their meals go um, throughout this. And it's a huge part because of the donors that have been able, been donating whatever items we need, who have been reaching out and asking, you know, what we need um, and have provided things like lunch bags, containers, utensils, and bottled water, which was really, really key this past summer. So as I said, a lot of women used our space to not just have a place to rest, but to escape from the heat. Um, and then these spaces were closed down to them this summer. And uh, Baltimore City, where you know in the past they've been able to provide resources to them or cooling centers, they weren't able to do that this year. So us being able to have bottled water to constantly pass out to these ladies to make sure they didn't get dehydrated was very precarious situation at first, but we received a huge donations from the community and were able to do that. And we never ran out of water, which was incredible. And next slide, please. 
So donors um, have also helped us with purchasing new clothing, which was really invaluable because of COVID-19, we had to suspend used clothing donations uh, because we did not have the capacity to be able to wash all donated items that came in. Um, but in the summertime, women still needed new clothes. And especially a lot of the ladies that we are serving now are unsheltered, um, completely unsheltered. And I guess the best way to explain that is that um, Baltimore City has overnight shelters, but not every person who's experiencing homelessness is able to access those shelters. Those who are in those shelters systems, they've been sheltering in place since March. So the women who are still coming to us have been those that aren't in the system. So they're either seeking shelter elsewhere or they're completely exposed. Um, so that's why it was really, really important to really narrow down our needs and understand that the population we're serving now is among the most vulnerable of our clients. And so the summer months were especially tough for those who are outdoors all day long, you know, um, can't even go into the library to cool down, can't come into our center, can't step into a 7-Eleven without people saying, what are you doing in here? You know, there was really no place for them to go. So being able to provide them with t-shirts and basketball shorts, stuff for them to feel comfortable in, new underwear, you know, a new socks. That was really, really, um, that was a key service that volunteers and donors were able to provide. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, so back to Mikhail. <laughs> So uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the keyholes that we needed to fill uh, once the pandemic started was what do we do to continue all of our day services? So we were, we were having kids out of school. Uh, we were having day programs shut down with Gallagher. And uh, like Julie, we saw a lot of people step up to become donors. Um, people who maybe volunteered their time before were now volunteering uh, their resources to uh, to help provide things for us to do throughout the day. Um, so uh, we use an Amazon wish list, uh, applied for some grants, uh, and uh, we're, we're able to um, move pretty swiftly on that. So we were really, really impressed with how quickly people reached out and asked, what do you need? What can I do now? We realized too that uh, that for, for people who are volunteering, um, you know, they're really committed to our programs. Um, they're not, they're doing, well, they're doing it because of their own values, right? So that doesn't end once a pandemic starts, right? There's a need for being able to express those values that comes out in volunteerism. So we, as volunteer managers, really also have been tending to, um, tending to the people that are part of our community to make sure that they feel connected still to the programs that they've served. Um, not saying just, all right, we'll just stay on hold uh, until this thing is over, but letting them know what's going on. So we can go to the next slide as well. Uh, we started getting donations of a, uh, essential supplies. Um, masks were really short at the beginning, as you remember, so we were having people uh, sew masks and drop those off. Um, it's really difficult too for our uh, uh, folks with Gallagher who are sheltering in place to uh, to go out and get the grocery items they needed. Uh, so we had donations of those come in. A lot of the people that we serve are medically fragile, so it wasn't necessarily safe for them to go out or safe for staff to be exposed um, to uh, to going shopping all the time. So uh, until we worked out online shopping, we were having community members help with that too. You can go to the next slide. And one of the things that a lot of our um, donors realized was that they wanted to be able to, um, to communicate to our staff and to the people that we serve that they were still thinking about them and that they uh, were uh, supportive of them. So we started people having, uh, we started getting people to volunteer to put together care kits for staff, uh, just little personal items to say, thank you. We realize now that you're, you were already doing a very hard job serving people um, who are in need and now maybe you're doing it in full PPE 
And a lot of our staff had to adjust to new schedules. They had their kids home with them. You know, a lot of what other people experienced during the pandemic as well was putting a lot of strain on people. So uh, we had vo people volunteer uh, to, to donate these types of items too. We also had donors put together other types of activity kits for uh, the people that we serve. So you'll see pictured there someone with, uh, I think that's it. Towson University students who'd put together movie night kits for uh, the people that we serve at Gallagher's to little concessions and some movie trivia to uh, to have a special night. So we had spa kits as well, I think. You can go to the next slide. We also um, started weekly meal deliveries to Villa Maria, Maria school students. So. Um, as a lot of you know, people uh, depend on schools for their meals a lot of the time. So when that was interrupted, um, that caused a uh, disruption in a lot of children's basic needs. So we weren't able to deliver food every day, uh, but the kids that we serve did have access to the food, service, food given by public school system. But we also felt like we wanted to be an encouragement to their families. Um, so we had volunteers sign up uh, to deliver about, uh, I think we did 60, about 65 meals uh, or 65 households with a couple meals. Uh, and we're continuing that uh, right now as well. So that's going to uh, families where the kids have severe behavioral and emotional issues. Recognition that not only is online learning hard and this change of pace hard for people uh, people with those types of challenges, but it's hard for their families as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we also had uh, people send in treats to encourage staff. Uh, you'll see there on the left, our staff with a bagel delivery that was there dropped off at St. Vincent's Villa for all the kids and the staff. People were sending pizzas to us uh, uh, dropping off uh, other types of treats. So it was really encouraging to see. Uh, next slide. And then one of the things I'm really most proud of is we were able within a couple of weeks to transition our mentoring program to a virtual only model. So as we, you know, so, so this program is really based on training individuals in the community to be matched with a child who has a lot of emotional uh, and behavioral challenges and they work with their therapists and so can you imagine being consistent in that relationship is really key uh, a lot of our kids haven't necessarily had consistency so we have to figure out a way to continue that um, because it really would have been an interruption to their treatment to not continue it uh, and it's been uh, a lot of work for our mentoring coordinator, Lauren Porter, who has been sitting in a lot of these meetings and facilitating them. But uh, as you can see, we have had uh, opportunities to continue to play games and do crafts. They've been mailing things back and forth. On the right there, you see a picture of the plant Rico, um, which was a seedling of green beans planted by uh, one of our mentees. And then we dropped it off at uh, his mentor's house and they monitored the progress of, of that growing uh, and would share pictures back and forth. And then um, at, the, at the harvest, um, we also, we, we set it up so they're meeting, they each had a meal of green beans that they could share over Zoom. So it was kind of fun. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we continued working outside as much as possible. Uh, so we would let individuals come and tend to the gardens, um, individual volunteers come and tend to the gardens that we had. Uh, we also were fortunate that our, our master gardener volunteers really rallied to realize that uh, they wanted to continue the horticultural vocational um, program with the people that uh, are supported by Gallagher Services and they put together gardening kits that our staff were able to drop off at the different houses so that they could continue to maintain their gardens in the spring and in the summer. Uh, next slide. And we've uh, implemented some virtual programs as well. So 
Uh, we have a club for the kids at St. Vincent's Villa that continues to meet virtually uh, with volunteers over Zoom. Uh, we've had a couple of different volunteers now uh, volunteer to make uh, activity videos for our program. So you can see there in the middle uh, a YouTube video uh, that this was learn how to draw animals from numbers, something that we were able to use in the day programs at Gallagher Services um, and also in our therapeutic mentoring program as well. So people continue to, to be engaged. We continue to try to get people involved and, and help out in this way. And I think one of the upsides of this, this ex pandemic experience has been as our programs really figure out how to use new technology, we're able to get people connected in new ways as well. So before this thing whole, this whole thing started, we didn't really necessarily have uh, Chromebooks in all the homes uh, for to connect people in home, but now we're looking at uh, being able to do that more and more. So uh, that has been a positive development. And then finally, I'll mention Book Buddies. We're working right now to implement another type of mentoring program at Villa Maria School where during the school day, we have people zoom in to provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, reading assistance to kids as well. So that's becoming part of our, our programming. And I think that was, next slide would be, would be Julie, so. Um, so during the pandemic, we started looking at remote and virtual volunteering. And the way that I defined that was remote is something you can do from home, but doesn't necessarily require a computer or internet, whereas virtual volunteering are activities that are done using the computer and the internet. So just like Mikhail um, said, you had to look at what the needs were and what could we still provide services. And it's been really interesting coming up with new ways um, for people to get connected. So Previously, we had meal service volunteers. These volunteers have really converted to meal service sponsors. So they select a date and a service with me, and then they provide the meal for all the ladies. And some people have donated catered food from a restaurant. Um, some students and, uh, and families have made casseroles or dishes at home. And we have some of our regular meal groups that used to come in before still honoring their commitment to us and providing a monthly meal um, and bringing it to our program. Next slide, please. We've also had volunteers who've collected donations for us and assembled them offsite, uh, which is what they would normally have done at the program, but something we were able to have them do um, at home. And as Mikhail said too, we asked for care packages, activity kits, you know, um, understanding too that we need tangible supplies, but we also need encouragement, you know, for our clients and for our staff. So this is one of our most awesome volunteers that put together a whole bunch of toiletry and care packages in those bags and dropped them off to us, which we distributed. Um, and we also have volunteers that write letters of encouragement to our ladies. So this is something that we had available for the ladies when they checked into our program before. And we had a big bucket of these. Um, and I have to say that our clients always loved it. They always loved reading these notes and sharing it with each other. And we really wanted to continue that. So at first we were writing notes of encouragement on the lunch bags, but then we had volunteers who still wanted to write these letters. So they've been sending them in and we get them out with every meal service. Um, and then the Christmas time we do Christmas cards of encouragement. And I really love this activity because, uh, especially when I'm working with students, I think it's, sometimes it can be really daunting to think about, you know, what can I do for a person that's in that situation, right? Even thinking like, well, I have no business even trying to encourage someone like that. And I really tell them that, you know, that is just your uh, fear talking. That's just a misunderstanding because what they, they would love to hear from you. You know, they love to hear, even read just, you're amazing just the way you are. Even getting a drawing, you know, if you don't know what to say or a positive quote from someone, it's really just the idea that someone took that time just to try to make someone feel better. Um, so I'm really, really happy that we've been able to continue offering that to our clients. And next slide, please. We also have some new virtual volunteering projects. Uh, these, this has been really interesting because um, I've always tried to create volunteer opportunities that fulfill a need, not just to say, oh, we can do something like this. And the different projects have 
kind of grown out of each other. So we started researching and networking with local food sources, especially in the beginning when the food situation, we weren't sure, right, um, what the availability was for food or with donations, especially when everyone was completely locked down. So we had volunteers who were looking up contact information. They were reaching out, even just saying like, hey, we just want you to know um, if you have any, if you ever want to try to support a community organization, my sister's place is here. And we were able to get great donations. So we did get uh, a whole meal service worth of Nando's Perry Perry chicken donated, which the ladies felt so special, you know, that they were able to get that because um, they don't normally get that. And I think the combination of different things like that, different new people reaching out and then the same groups coming and making the same great food that they love. And they know like when the groups are coming <laughs> and they make sure they're there. But um, that whole combination of it, they really have felt that the community has supported them throughout this. And I think that's a huge win when the volunteers aren't able to physically be there. Next slide, please. So uh, looking ahead to the holidays then, we really wanna try to provide the same amount of support that we were able to provide last year, even though it's uh, looking like a very different year. So, oh, I'm so sorry. This is Mikhail's. No, you're fine. I, I apologize. I just started going. You, you said it perfectly. We are looking to provide the same level of support and it's going to be a little bit tricky this year. So uh, we've had to cancel some activities um, that had in-person groups working. Um, but we've been uh, asking for people's creative ideas for how we can do other activities. So, um, so for instance, someone is sponsoring a drive through Santa visit for St. Vincent's Villa, where I think they're going to put Santa in like a fire truck or a convertible of some sort and provide lunch kits. Um, you know, a big thing we do every year is deck the halls at St. Vincent's Villa uh, with, uh, you know, usually we have like 120 volunteers uh, uh, descend uh, and just decorate all over the place. And obviously we can't do that this year, but someone uh, is raising money uh, to sponsor a professional decorator. So we continue to have our needs. Um, you know, this is the time of year, not when we just get in, uh, donations for for items that are used at this time of year we get in a lot of the stuff that we use throughout the year a lot of what our staff use in therapy with people or in activities with folks so we're continuing to ask people to uh, to to register for that so that's seasonalwonder.com and this year we're providing instructions on how to mail things in, but we'll have a contactless drop off as well for a few days. Um, there's more information on the website about that. And then um, we, our volunteering options are pretty limited, uh, but we do continue to have things like book buddies and meal deliveries. Um, and we might need some folks for some socially distanced gift wrapping as well. Um, but it's gonna, be, it's gonna be different this year. Right, Julie? I'll turn it over to you now. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely definitely going to be different, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much as Lisa she could say. But so like Mikhail said, we're really trying to see what we can still provide um, in a safe way. So we've added winter weather kits to our remote volunteering. In the past, we were asking for toiletry and feminine hygiene kits during the summer and fall months. And we were able to get enough of that that we're able to start winter weather items. So that's things such as winter hats, gloves, scarves, a thick socks, things that every woman uh, will need during this winter time. And we're also promoting donation drives for new coats and new boots. This was something we were able to provide last year through partnerships with other community organizations, and we've already gotten inquiries about that. As I said, a lot of the ladies that we are serving right now are those who are um, very exposed for the most part, so this is going to be a really key, key supply that we can get to them. We're also working on, uh, we're still going to be providing adopt a family where we work with families experiencing homelessness or poverty to provide gifts to their children. There's a program at my sister's place, uh, the Family Stability Program, which is a uni United Way funded program that works with uh, families that are in danger of being evicted and becoming homeless that have school aged children in uh, the 21218 zip code in Baltimore City. So what we do is we work with them to get um, 
I find adoptive family sponsors and then I connect them with a family in need. And this was something that um, was amazing last year. We were able to provide over 50 families with gifts for their children. And we even had some donors that threw in a couple of gifts for the adults as well, for the parents. So that was a really, really great thing to do. Uh, so these are pictures from last year. Uh, last year, we were able to do big distributions. We were able to even have ladies try on coats. This year, it's going to be really, really different. So we're really thinking about how do we um, make it really efficient? How do we make it really fair? How do we make sure it's accessible to all the ladies that are in need? Next slide, please. So our virtual volunteers are going to be helping us in promoting. Uh, they'll come up, help us come up with materials to promote and advertise and promote our needs in their personal networks or in the, ne the people that they've researched. Um, and they'll continue existing projects of food source research and even fundraiser planning. So really coming up with ideas. And what I love about the virtual volunteers is they've come up with these ideas on their own too. Right? So I can really see that the community has all these ideas. Like, what if we do this? What if we do this? And so we're really trying to learn and see what we can do and how we can expand our network and how we can get these clients even more support. Uh, we're going to be adding even more opportunities as we move forward into 2021. I think that 2020 was a big giant test run for the most part, but I'm really excited about um, the different new setups that we have. Our website is uh, at cc-md.org slash volunteer MSPWC. This is the link to our portal that has our donation needs and descriptions of our volunteer opportunities. It used to be for scheduling, but at this point it is just for information giving. Uh, but on that site too, you can message me and uh, once I see you apply, then I reach out as well too. The next slide. Okay. Thank you, Mikkel and Julie, for your thoughtful presentation and for sharing your experiences with us. I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to open to the floor um, if they have, if anyone has any questions for Mikkel or Julie at this point. Hey, Mikkel and Julie. Uh, thanks so much. That was great. Um, quick, not to put you on the spot too much, but I was curious about, have you had are there any um, anecdotes that you can share about an experience that you've had with a client, uh, um, you know, that has been maybe challenged a bit more because of the lack of volunteers since the pandemic started? Um, and then follow up to that, what's been your biggest kind of personal professional challenge through all of this as kind of the folks on the front line mm -hmm. trying to manage all of this? Those you are easy questions, Pat. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge for our clients uh, and the people that we serve had, uh, on our end has been not being able to go out um, and not being able to go uh, have visits with, with family in the traditional sense. And we've been able to do um, some of that uh, over the last months uh, as we've figured out safer ways to do that. But um, one of the, you know, so there's been a lack of uh, different types of um, opportunities for, you know, for, for the kids that we serve, we try to keep, keep childhood as normal as possible. Um, and so one of the things we actually did yesterday, I feel like is our first event that we held in many months was we did a trunk or treat at St. Vincent's Villa. Uh, we, had, uh, we had volunteers come and do some decorating and donating of candy. So we had the Mercy Ridge retirement community across the street, they put together treat bags. Uh, we had Harkins Builders came and put together some, uh, some displays. And then we couldn't use volunteers, so we used staff as volunteers to have uh, to have a um, sort of socially distanced trick or treating experience with the kids. And I think it was just such a breath of fresh air for everyone, you know, to be able to do something that felt um, I don't know, I, I don't like the term normal, but felt a little bit normal, you know. Uh, and it was for the staff as well, so. We're going to continue to to look at options like that. Um, 
I think, yeah, as far as the greatest kind of professional challenge, I think was your, the second part of your, your question. It's just been how quickly everything moved uh, in the spring. And I think uh, just figuring out how to communicate with, with everyone. Um, we are, I think we're very much used to seeing people in person and chatting about how things are going and giving program updates to volunteers and donors by uh, hanging out with them for a bit uh, at activities and figuring out how to keep everyone feeling like a community going forward was, uh, was a challenge that we had to meet. And all of a sudden everyone was at home in different fashions and uh, we needed to you know, maintain that cohesiveness as, as I'm sure people have had to do in their personal lives as well. So. Yeah, I definitely think um, for clients, the loss of the community that they had, you know, the people that they, that asked how they were every time they saw them, all the volunteers, you know, that the monthly ones they would recognize or even new ones, just getting to interact with people that's been taken away from them, you know. Um, even we had clients who we had to just shut down our showers for about for three months before we could get the safety measures in place. And when we opened back up, one woman was like, she said, this is the first shower I've had since you guys closed. So they came to us for the essential services, but they came to us because we were their friends too. Um, and I think that's kind of been the hardest thing for the staff as well as that trying to continue to provide resources uh, but not feeling like we're able to help them as much as we can getting like being worried about them You know the ones that are in the shelter they're sheltered in place now So we haven't been able to see them wondering how they are um, Wondering if they've lost momentum on their housing or their employment Which is the stuff that they're working on with case managers a lot of that just all of a sudden got put on pause got put on hold or changed drastically people who were about to move into a home had to wait in the shelter so I think it was really demoralizing in the beginning to just kind of be completely separated from each other. But I think that we've really fought, fought to get back to each other. Um, you know, we get more and more ladies coming. Um, a lot of the regular ones still coming every single day, even when they couldn't come in. And that was, that was really hard at the beginning. Uh, I remember there was one day when it was raining and it was like the first week that everything had been shut down and, this woman was still coming every day and she was just standing outside in the rain, outside of the door. And I could see her, she was three feet away from me. And like the staff just had to keep walking by, you know, we asked, we tried to get her everything, got her umbrella, got whatever, you know, that we could as much as we could. But that was definitely the hardest part was feeling helpless. Um, but like I said, the staff, they really put their heart into being able to still be there for the ladies and the volunteers. Everyone has always been reaching out to me, you know, since it started asking what we need. I definitely have felt so much support through this. Um, and I think that we're all just really ready and even more appreciative now of all the different lives that we can come into contact with and that we really benefit from knowing. So no matter where we come from. Well, thanks for those answers. That's really, really uh, well done and really affirms kind of what we're doing here. So thanks again, Julie and Mikkel. That was great. You're Appreciate welcome. It. Thank you so much for allowing us to share about this. Are there any other questions from our, our guests today? Hi, Natalie, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Mark. Um, I, I don't have a question as much as a thank you um, to Mikhail and, and Julie for a the you know very uh, uh, sobering and 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 description of the difficult realities, um, but also the the affirming um, commitment of volunteerism even in this kind of virtual rea uh, reality world that we're in, um, and it's uh, definitely renewed my spirit to continue to. Uh, to support Catholic charities in any way I can possibly do, particularly in terms of spreading the good news and, and getting more friends involved. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, if no one else has any other questions, um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to once again thank Mikhail Christensen and Julie Martin for speaking with us today. and. 
of course, if you can both, you know, give a thanks to each one of your staffs for the yeoman's work I know that you've been doing since this has been happening to provide the level of care and the level of services that we do for the agency, for those that we serve. So kudos for everything that you do day in and day out. Um, unseen and sometimes, you know, unappreciated and un unknown of, but we really appreciate everything that you guys do. So thank you so much. Thank you guys. I, I can honestly say that I've never felt unappreciated. So okay. it's, yeah. it's a pleasure to work with people that really, really want to help others and to be of the same mission. Yes. Well, it's such a big community of, of people and I appreciate the way that our staff have rallied together, but also just how people have been reaching out to see what's needed. Uh, you know, it's definitely a time in the world where it's easy to feel isolated, um, but I've not in the work that we've been doing, I haven't felt Absolutely. isolated. Well, thank you again for your time and for your thoughts. Um, thank you to, again to our guests. Our next Lunch and Learn session will be hosted on Thursday, November 12th at noon. And we will be discussing the topic of senior living post COVID with Zachary Richards, who is our administrator of St. Elizabeth Rehabilitation and Nursing Center. We hope that you'll be able to join us. Thank you again, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.